Hey, Cactus class. Today we're going to talk about topic 17, derivatives in the wor real world. Um, and for those of you who have taken physics, you're going to see a lot of physics uh, relationships in this topic. So the first thing we're going to talk about is displacement versus distance. The displacement of an object is the distance between an object's starting spot and its ending spot. The distance traveled is the total distance traveled of an object during a given time period. So, if we're to look at this picture, the displacement is just from where the, per the child started to where she ended. That is the displacement. Whereas the distance is the total amount of distance that she traveled to get to her ending spot. And here's another example. So if you were to start here and end here, the displacement is just the distance from the starting point to the ending point. Whereas the distance is the path that you take to get to your end. Motion along a line. A particle moves along a line so that its position at any time between t equals zero and t equals 10 is given by the function s of t equals t squared minus 4t plus three, where s is measured in feet and t is measured in seconds. What is the velocity at time t? So every time it asks for velocity, you should think derivative of the position function. So you're going to take the derivative of s of t to get 2t minus 4. And of course, the units are going to be feet per second. When is the particle at rest? Now that should tell you that the velocity is going to be 0. That's when a particle is not moving. So I'm going to go ahead and set the derivative equal to 0 and solve for t. So at two seconds, the particle is not moving. When is the particle moving in the negative direction? This means when is the velocity negative? So we need to determine when is the derivative less than zero. So that means you're gonna set up intervals. So that means you're gonna go from zero to two because two is the fact that we know is this, the particle is not moving, two to 10, so within the interval. So then you're going to pick a value within the interval, and I chose one, to see if I got a positive or negative value in the velocity function, the derivative. So I got a negative value for zero to two seconds. Then I'm gonna do the same thing from two to 10. I picked three, I get a positive value. So this tells me that the particle is moving in the negative direction, in this case left, between zero and two seconds because s prime is less than zero. What is the total distance traveled by the particle? So we know at t equals zero, the particle is at three feet. So I just plugged zero into my position function. At two, because that is when I know it's not moving, the particle is at the position of negative one. And then at 10, I plug in 10 into our position function and get a position of 63. So using this information, I am going to sketch out on a line what the particle is doing. So I have this lovely little line, and we know that the negative direction is left, the positive direction is right. At three, that tells me that is when t equals zero. That is the start. And I know that between zero to two, the particle is moving in the negative direction. So that means I have to go left to get to where the particle is at two seconds which is at negative one. 
then I know that the particle then has to turn around and go to the positive direction because I know that we got two here. So I'm going in the positive direction. The particle lands at 63 when t equals 10, and that is our finish. So to sketch out the total distance, I know the particle is moving left, then the particle has to turn around and go all the way to 63. So I need to know my total distance that the particle has traveled. <clears throat> so every time we're dealing with distance, that means absolute value because distance can't be negative. So the distance between three and negative one is four feet. Then I'm gonna take the distance between negative one and 63 to get 64 feet. So that tells me that my total distance is gonna be four plus 64, which is 68 feet. And the last part, what is the displacement of the particle? So that means that I just want to find the total distance from the start to the finish point. So that means I want the distance between three and 63. So in that case, it is 60 feet. Vertical motion. If you have a ball and it's thrown vertically upward with a velocity of 80 feet per second, then its height after t seconds is given by the following position function. We want to know what is the maximum height reached by the ball. So if you can just picture a ball is being thrown up vertically, and eventually it has to turn around and come back down to the ground. So our maximum is going to occur at where the ball turns around. And that means there's gonna be a horizontal tangent line at that maximum height. So that maximum point is going to have to be where the derivative equals zero. So I'm gonna take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So there's my derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for t, and you would get 2.5 seconds. Now, that's not what the question's asking us. The question asks, what is the maximum height? Not when does the ball reach its maximum height? So you have to pay attention if they want the time it reaches its maximum height or what the actual maximum height is. So to actually get the maximum height, we have to plug in the 2.5 into your position function because we know the maximum will occur at 2.5 seconds. So I plug it into my position function and simplify to get 100 feet. And this would be what the graph would look like of this path of the ball. So it was thrown upward at 2.5 seconds. It hit its maximum height of 100 and then turned around and came back down to the ground. What is the velocity of this ball when it is 64 feet above the ground? Well, we know its position, but we don't know the time at which it's at this position. So we need to know the time value of the position at 64. So I'm taking the my position function, setting it equal to 64, and now I'm going to solve for t. So I'm, I have a quadratic, I factor a negative 16, divide both sides by negative 16, so the negative 16 doesn't matter, and factor the t squared minus 5t plus 4 to get t minus 1 times t minus 4. So therefore, the velocity is going, or sorry, the ball will be at 64 feet at t time equals 1 second and 4 seconds. So now since we know at what times it's gonna be at 64 feet, we can now determine the velocity at these times. So I'm going to take t equals one, plug it into my velocity function, and I would get 48 feet per second. And then I would plug in four into my velocity function and get negative 48 feet per second. Derivatives in economics. So I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard any um, 
talk in the economics or anything, but uh, you will hear d the word derivative every once in a while. So engineers use the term velocity to refer to the derivatives of functions describing motion. Econo economic, uh, sorry, <laughs> economists too have a specialized vocabulary for rates of change in derivatives. They, are, they call them marginals. So this is just a little table to show you what the, the exact same thing means in different contexts. So in calculus, we have our original function. In physics, we call the original function the position function. In economics, we call the original function cost of production. Then we have the derivative function. Physics, we call that the instantaneous velocity function. In economics, we call that the marginal cost of production. So economics also study marginal demand, marginal revenue, and marginal profit. These are all the derivatives of the demand, revenue, and profit functions. So I just chose the cost of production for the, cha for the table. So let's go ahead and look at an example. The cost function for producing washing machines is given by C of X equals 2000 plus 100X minus 0.1X squared. We want to find C prime of 100 and describe its meaning. So I'm gonna first find the derivative of C of X. Then I'm gonna go ahead and plug in 100 for X in my derivative. And I go ahead and simplify to get 80. And of course you do want your units, dollars per washing machine. And what this means is that C prime of 100 is the rate at which the cost is increasing, since we have a positive derivative, as the 100th washing machine is produced. It predicts the cost of the 101st machine. So now we're going to compare C prime of 100 with the cost of producing the 101st item. So from part A, we can estimate the cost of producing the 101st machine to be the cost of production of the 100th washing machine plus 80, because that's what we got from part A as after the 100th washing machine is produced, the cost is $80 per machine. So I'm going to plug in 100 into my cost function, simplify it, then I'm going to add 80 to get approximately $11,080. Now we can check by calculating the exact value of the cost of the 100th and first machine. So I'm gonna plug in 100 into my cost function, simplify it, and that is pretty dang close to what I got up here. All right, I hope you enjoyed the derivatives in the real world, and I will see you in class tomorrow. Have a good night.